going to invite you to turn and grab a Bible. There may be one in front of you, or if you brought one, or if you got a phone. Get to Matthew chapter 19. The words will also be on the screen for you. And as you are finding it, I want to just talk about one of the distinctives of this church that I find as really important in this season after Easter. And that distinctive is uh, represented through our cross here. I, I love, you know, it, it is a treacherous thing to go all the way up to that cross. And it's a blessing that Ignacio, our janitor, goes all the way up there to change those colors. Um, and the white for us represents as Protestants the fact that Jesus is risen. Right? And that is a distinctive from our Catholic brothers and sisters who I love, but they typically, if you see a cross from one of our Catholic brothers and sisters, Jesus is still there. And one of the reasons why I like the Protestant representation of the cross is because it reminds us that we don't always stay in our pain points that our pain points are part of our journey of transformation, and that Jesus came to die and be crushed and rise again so that we could have new life with him and new hope with him. And so what my prayer is is that we learn about how we might join with him in this process again and again of new life, of Not living in our pain and death and sorrow, but joining with him in the fact that we get to rise again with him. So with that, I'm going to read our scripture today, and I'll read the whole thing, and then we'll kind of break it down after that. Matthew chapter 19 says, Just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life. Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones, he inquired. Jesus replied, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven. Then you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Well, first thing to say here is, be careful what you ask Jesus. You just might get an answer. And I think that there's really interesting things that opened up for me as I was studying this passage that I'm hoping to pass on to you about the way this conversation takes place between this rich, young ruler and Jesus and the way that they talk about what it means to have eternal life? What does it mean to participate in God's kingdom? And you can kind of get a hint. A lot of scholars talk about this passage right at the beginning with that question. Because this guy has everything our culture wants. He has got the money, he's got youth, and he's got power. And so, up front, we might even say, why does this guy need to go talk to Jesus? He's already got what most of us are already praying for. He's got affluence. He's got power. He's, he's everything that everybody who wants 15 minutes of fame is going after and seeking and wanting in our culture. And some of us are like, you don't need to go to Jesus. You already got it. You got what you go to Jesus for. And actually, it says in Mark that, that Jesus loved the rich young ruler uh, because he saw in him a question. 
he saw in him that he wanted to go beyond what he had, but he didn't know how to do it. And so he comes, you could imagine uh, Dale Bruner, who's an amazing scholar on Matthew, talks about, you know, think about the way he's framed this question of, like, Jesus, what do I got to do? I have money. I have power. So what do I got to do to get eternal life? And there's a real dynamic there, right? And I think we easily can fall into this dynamic of do to get. What do I have to do to get? And we're trying to, in this, like, how the rich young ruler was, create some leverage with God. We're trying to do a little negotiating with our Heavenly Father. And we're trying to say, well, if I do this, then you got to do that. How am I going to find that one offer that this guy's looking at? Like, what is the offer that I can give Jesus that nobody else can so that I can get eternal life? And I love how Jesus responds. Because he picks up on this concept of goodness. And he says, there is only one who is good. And what's wonderful about that is that everything good that we have is on loan from God. From the puppy that greets you when you get home with that big smile on his face ready to lick you and the joy that you feel from that to penicillin. That all of it is an outpouring and an overflow of the goodness of God. God is letting you borrow his goodness, experience his goodness. Everything that is good comes from him. Have you ever forgot that the good things in your life are on loan from God? I know I have. The things that I complain about, they are built off blessings, right? It's like the things that I'm trying to figure out and cause me stress and anxiety are built off of God's goodness. I have a wife. I have a family. I have a wonderful church. All things that I'm trying to figure out, okay, how do I make this go smoother? How do I make it go better? How am I going to deal with the responsibility of these things and really, really iron it out? But I don't take as much time to think about the fact that I don't deserve any of those. You guys have met Katie. You know I don't deserve her. You know that... <laughs> Claps, literal claps. <laughs> so, but think about that. Think about if I had to create leverage with God and say, to get these things, this is what I'm going to do. What do you think God says in return? He says, that's laughable. I look at my kids and I just am in awe that somehow these beings are connected to me in any possible way. I don't have the genius to make them grow and come about. And I think about this church. I think about if I had to create leverage with God, God, if I do this, then... I get to be the pastor of a church? <laughs> Give me a break. God's just saying, this is your gift from my overflow of my goodness. And it's so basic as to say, this is how you are shaped and crafted by the creator of the universe. You don't have negotiating power with God. You can't create leverage with God, rich young ruler. There's nothing you can offer him. The bigness and grandness of the one who makes the sun rise and fall is not moved by your offer. 
He's only good because he is good. And so the offers come from him. He says, you want to participate in the kingdom? That's the conversation we should be having. And so they have this great conversation, I think. Fascinating conversation. If you ever want to enter life, keep the commandments. So another distinctive here. Jesus says there's only one who is good. And then he says, if you want to enter life, then keep the commandments. He's not saying, follow the rules and you will get. He's not saying you get anything. He's saying you don't get eternal life. You get to enter into eternal life. You get to participate with God. You get to, by following these commandments, enter through portholes that allow for you to operate in the way God wants you to operate and be who God wants you to be. And one of the ways that I heard this explained a long time ago is I was having problems with all them rules that Christians are known for was to think of it like this, and I think I've said this before, but it's worth repeating, is that that the rules are there so that you can play the game. If you've ever played a sport, it's not very much fun if there's no rules. But if you're so focused on the rules and only the rules, you ain't in the game. You're the referee. And God isn't calling you to be the referee. He gets to be the referee. You get to participate in the game. You are called in. He's saying, rich young ruler, you look like you want to get off the bench and get in the game. Here's the way to do that. Here's the way to enter into. It's a way of being, not a you have to. Come participate in this kingdom life. And, you know, those guys in the NBA right now, they, they break some rules sometimes. But they also go really hard at playing the game. And they keep at it. And I think that's what God's most interested at in, is are you in the game? Are you going for it? You may break some rules every once in a while, but are you going as hard as you can at the kingdom of God? Is that what you want more than anything else? And noticeably in this list, what's missing is the first commandment, which is, do not have other gods before me. That commandment to not worship idols. And so when Jesus is reciting this list, it's a noticeably missing component because perhaps the rich young ruler and we discover he was good at following the commandments that were on the list but the one he was missing is the one he will ultimately be challenged by the one that he will ultimately be called to account for and so let's keep reading All those I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, If you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give them to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad, because he had great wealth. Well, not every text is for every person. That may come to you as good news this morning. If we read a chunk of scripture, it doesn't mean that you have to immediately identify with the rich young ruler and then 
I could easily just say, okay, well then now, everybody sell everything they have, give it up, and we'll all live monastic lives together in some commune. You ready for that? Because we see countless examples of other times where Jesus is talking about wealth, and he's dealing with the people around him, and he has different challenges based off of where those people were at. But there may be some rich young rulers here today. There may be some people who are struggling with how they are putting their trust in their finances. And they forgot to aim for the higher aims of the kingdom of God. Because the opportunity before the rich young ruler is one that is better than being rich. Because Jesus is saying, you may be rich, I'm richer. It's one better than the power that he has. He, he may be saying, rich young ruler, yeah, you have some power here in this region. But the opportunity is way, way more powerful than the power you experience by telling your servants where to go and what to do. And yes, you're young now, but you'll get old. And you can't take any of this with you. And so what you lack is the right aim, ultimately. And as a young four-year-old, my dad stood me right in front of the garage, put a bat in my hand, and he said, Son, if you want to be good at baseball, keep your eye on the ball. The number one thing you got to do is keep your eye on the ball. Because there are going to be so many distractions. Everyone is going to try and keep you from keeping your eye on the ball when you are at bat. But if you can focus on that ball, then you will win the game. And I think that's the problem Jesus is pointing out with the rich young ruler. He's just saying, what you aiming at? I love you in all truth and love. I want you to have the experience of a lifetime. The experience of following Jesus Christ. God on earth, walking the earth, healing and forgiving and loving and teaching and building his church. That was the opportunity that was presented to the rich young ruler. And Jesus' opportunity is that good. And we see other characters in the Bible that respond the way that we would hope that we would respond, right? We think of Zacchaeus, who's called down from that sycamore tree, and Jesus says, I'm coming to your house. And out of that exchange, out of that conversation about what it means to truly be saved, there's an expression that, that this man who was all about focusing on finances and getting wealth is now realizing that the kingdom of God is more important. And so out of that, he just says, however I can participate, I'll pay it back. Because this is more important than that. Or we might think of that widow that came with the little that she had with nothing in the bank account. And she gave it to Jesus. And Jesus used that moment to teach his disciples that what she had done was more important than rich people giving from their wealth. And that's what I want to be about on my good days. What I want to do is participate with you in these experiences and encounters with Jesus. 
because I believe that's what matters in the end. Those will be the stories that are told at our funerals. I've yet to be there when somebody said, John Smith got really rich. And that's what made him important. After that person had passed away. But I've been there many times where people said, my friend, my father, my mother, my sister was a generous person, a giving person. And let me tell you what that did for me and how it changed my life. And so there are only the experiences that shape our lives. And so I pray that out of our giving spirit and our sacrifice, that God would give us those moments where we get to live and build in the kingdom of God. Final story is a couple, uh, last week actually, there were so many things that happened, I, it seems longer, but on Thursday, we had a choir from Fair Oaks Presbyterian Church. Their Acts Choir came. It's about 60 high school students came and sang for our sack lunch program. And my mom had the idea, because it was her spring break, to have Remy get Easter eggs and try and hand them out while the choir was singing. Well, that didn't go that great. So after a while, we decided to sit and watch the performance. And we're sitting there watching the performance. And then all of a sudden, I see two dollars, like, pass by and go right into Remy's hand. And I look back, and it was one of the participants from our sack lunch program. Somebody that I knew did not have a lot. And, of course, my four-year-old lit up because he knew two dollars meant candy or toys. And I was so blessed again by the idea that somebody who didn't have that much wanted to give and wanted to participate in a life of generosity. And I started to think about, that's how I am too, right? I mean, God has it all. He has the storehouses of heaven. And I come with my two dollars. And I say, God, here's my two dollars. And sometimes I go, aren't I great? I gave you two dollars. And I think God just says, like, can you imagine if I went to the guy and said, well, we have two dollars. It's good. You know, I can give my son money. But no. God just says, thank you. Thank you for participating in my generosity. Thank you for being able to see that those little acts of faithfulness bless my soul and bring glory to our Father in heaven. And so may we pray about how we can do that in greater and greater ways together in this season. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we come with our humble offering. We come broken in need of grace. And we take so much solace and comfort in knowing only you are good. And so I pray that you help us to focus in, give us your aims, that we might seek first the kingdom of God. And in that, we would have everything else that we need because you care and love and are there for us through every season. So be with us now. In your name we pray. Amen.